In this lesson, we want to talk about what the Bible says about you. The Bible, of course, talks about many different things. It talks about the meaning of life in Ecclesiastes. It talks about righteousness and wickedness throughout the Bible. It highlights people involved in righteousness or wickedness and how God responded to those people and their behavior. It tells us about various nations and the rise and fall of those nations, the glory or the shame of those nations. It would give some details about them, maybe politically, religiously, of course, geographically, where they are located. So it gives a lot of information about those things, including the nation of Israel, its formation, development, and whether or not it was faithful to God at various times. The Bible, of course, tells us about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In fact, the only way we know God is through His Word. But then also the Bible tells us about specific individuals. Sometimes it gives us great detail. Sometimes it's just a very brief mention. Maybe just their name is recorded in the Word of God. But it tells us about these individuals. You think about men like Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, various men who either served God diligently in their life or they rebelled against God or more likely a combination of the two, how they were faithful at times, but then they had their periods of downfall, their times of weakness. It tells us about women, of course, as well. You think about Eve, think about Sarah, and how that she served Abraham and respected him. The Bible highlights that, and that she was a woman of faith. We can read about Esther, or about Jezebel, who was an extremely wicked woman and rebelled against God. Or, perhaps on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, read about Mary in the New Testament, how that she gave birth to the Christ child, and she was found faithful and pure in the eyes of God. And so she was greatly blessed by giving birth to Jesus. So there are many individuals in the Bible that we can look to and we can read about and learn about. But this lesson, again, is focused on what the Bible says about you, because the Bible is not just about ancient peoples, ancient events, principles that no longer apply today. No, the Bible is relevant to you and I today. In fact, the Word of God is because it is truth, is just as applicable to us today as it was to people of ancient times. So we want to think, what does the Bible say about you? I need to think, what does the Bible say about me? The first thing that we want to note is the Bible says you are created in the image of God. So if you get your Bible and you turn back to Genesis chapter 1, where it gives us a record of creation. In Genesis 1, 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So whether you're male or female, of course, you're created in the image of God. That makes you special. That makes you unique above all other creation. The Word of God tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you think about that, that even with all the advancements we've made today in technology, that man cannot recreate artificially man. So there's procreation where we have children, of course, but even the best robots and artificial intelligence that exists today is nowhere near as complex and amazing as a human being. We are made by God and in the image of God. Now, our body is not in the image of God, but our soul is. What's what is eternal in us, if you will. If you notice this in First Thessalonians chapter 5, 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5 over in the New Testament, as Paul is closing out this letter, he says this in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he describes man as having three different parts, if you will. So he says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. What is spirit, soul, and body? Well, we're going to break it down like this. We all know what the body is, right? It's this physical vessel that we exist in in this world. But then it also says we have a spirit and a soul. Now, the spirit in this context is the idea of the life animating force. You know, we have life. We we're able to interact and move and and do different things. So we have life force, just like animals. You know, they have life in them and they move about and they have a mind and they do various things in this world. But then also we have a soul. And the soul is that which is eternal, that which is really made in the image of God. And what allows us to have fellowship with God, the animals don't have fellowship with God because they're not made in God's image. You and I are made in the image of God, and therefore we can have fellowship with him. So we are made of spirit, soul, and body, and we are made in the image of God and are above all other creation. So that's the first thing the Bible says about you. You're made in the image of God, and that makes you special. But then also we have free will. There are some people who deny that man has free will, that they think that man is wholly subject to whatever path God has laid out for him, that man doesn't really make decisions, that it's a foregone conclusion. Sometimes you hear this discussed as predestination. It's a very Calvinistic type of idea. Now, when they say that man doesn't have free will, there are things that they would say that God had determined before time began and and we can't alter it. So they would go so far as to say, well, if you stub your toe on the furniture, that was God's will. If you make it through a red light, well, that's because it was God's will. But here's the thing. They would also say, if your child gets cancer and dies, that's God's will. Or if your wife or your sister are raped, well, that's because it was God's will. And you see, looking at the nature of man that way and God's relationship to man in that way, that makes God a monster. It really causes people to be bitter toward God. Well, why would God do that to me? Why would he do that to my family? Why would he do that to those who are innocent and pure? But see, that's not what the Bible teaches. And when people look at the idea that man is controlled in every aspect by God, then they say that man can only have faith in God if God wills it. Well, we know we have to have faith in God to go to heaven. So here's the thing. If you don't have faith in God, That's because God didn't will it, and God wants you to go to hell. That really is true Calvinism. And a lot of people have bought into it in the religious realm. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that man has free will. You have free will. I have free will. So let's look at some examples in the Word of God of people who had free will. If you remember Abraham, Abram, as he's called early on in the account of his life, he had a nephew by the name of Lot, and they had disputes with each other, uh, or their herdsmen had disputes on grazing the animals. And so there was uh, an occasion 
that came up that they had to go separate ways. And in Genesis chapter 13, Genesis 13, verse 8, it says this. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed the east, and they separated from each other. You see, Lot made a choice here. Now, it turns out, as you keep reading, Lot made a bad choice, but Lot made a choice. Abraham said, you go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You just choose, is what he's saying. And then it tells us that Lot did indeed choose which way to go. Remember Joshua twenty four fifteen, where Joshua is standing before the children of Israel, and in his farewell speech to them, he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, the children of Israel had a choice. It was up to them to decide whether or not they would serve God or whether or not they would serve idols. You have a choice. I have a choice. Now, some New Testament examples of this. In Acts chapter 13, let's just look at one of these here. In Acts chapter 13, as Paul and Barnabas are preaching in a city by the name of Antioch, they have preached to the Gentiles, and the Jews become angry and upset that Paul and Barnabas are preaching to Gentiles. So this is what Paul and Barnabas say to them in Acts 13, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, in contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. You see how... They tell these Jews that are filled with anger and envy, who are blaspheming, they say, you have judged yourselves. You've made a decision. You have decided to reject the gospel, to reject God's will, to reject Jesus as the Christ. You see, they had free will, just like you have free will and I have free will. And all men have free will. God is not manipulating and controlling everything that happens in our life or the lives of others. And there's a dynamic process, if you will. Other people make decisions that affect me. It's out of my control, but that's not God making them do things or God having foreordained that someone would hurt me. You see, we have free will. We make choices in life, and we suffer consequences of our choices and the choices of others. So the Bible says that you have a free will, and that means that you are accountable, and I am accountable to God. Because we have the ability to decide to do right or wrong, that means we are accountable to the Lord. We're accountable to the Lord for the deeds that we do in this life, for the things we actually do, the, the actions we take. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So our deeds, our actions, are things for which we will give an account on the day of judgment. But it's not just our actions but it's also our words. So look in Matthew 12, verse 36. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus says this, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it 
in the day of judgment. So for every word we speak, including, he says, every idle word. Now that that's pretty frightening. It, it, it's one thing to be judged for our actions, and that's scary enough in and of itself. But it says we're going to be judged for our words, for every idle word. How many idle words do we speak on a daily basis, let alone adding those up through our lifetime? See, we're going to have to give an account for those things one day when we stand before the Lord in judgment. But it goes further than that. If you notice in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5, where Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he says he knows our very thoughts in our hearts, that is, in our minds. And we're going to have to give an account. And he judges us on those thoughts. In Matthew 5, verse 28, he says, But I say to you that whoever looks on a, at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So that lust that someone may have in their heart or the, the hatred or the envy or the bitterness, the anger that they, they just have a thought about that. God sees that and we will be held accountable for it. So we're made in the image of God and we have free will. That means that we are accountable to God for our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Now let's come back in just a minute and continue to see what the Bible says about us. Because right now you may be thinking, I don't like the sound of that. You know the truth of it, but that truth stings a little bit, but let's come back and talk a little bit further about what the Bible says that gives us encouragement, gives us hope about ourselves. So let's come back in just a moment and think about these things. We continue our study now on what the Bible says about you. Of course, it's the same thing that the Bible says about me, but sometimes people get it in their mind. Well, the Bible really doesn't apply to me. Well, it does most definitely apply to you. The first thing that we noted that the Bible says about you is that you're created in the image of God, and that makes you special. That makes you unique from all other creation, and it allows you to have fellowship with God. We also noted that we have a free will. We make decisions on what we want to do in this life. And because we have free will, we are accountable to God and we'll give an answer for our thoughts, our words, and our deeds in the day of judgment. Now, let's understand that we are also sinners. The Bible says that all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans 3, verse 23. In fact, if you turn over to Romans chapter 3, there's kind of an extended discussion there that Paul gives as he talks about men and the rebellion of men toward God. And you and I fall into that category. In Romans 3, verse 9, he says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. See, we've turned aside away from God and committed sin against Him. When we come into this world, we are innocent. We are pure. But we grow, we mature, we advance in comprehension and understanding, and we reach a point where we understand right from wrong, where we have this maturity. Now, we recognize there are some people who mentally don't develop in their life. We're not talking about them, of course, but we're talking about those who reach a point of maturity, uh, a point of growth and development in their moral faculty, moral comprehension of this world, that they choose to sin. We choose to sin and are therefore separated from God. In Romans 3 verse 21, Paul goes on to say, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who are on to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have. And 
let's understand that we choose to sin. We're tempted by the devil. We're drawn away. And we do that which violates the will of God. Notice James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, let's read beginning here in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. That death it's talking about there is spiritual death, a separation from God. So we all sin, and we're guilty of some kind of sin. In Galatians chapter 5, the apostle gives a list there of sins that he describes as the works of of the flesh. So Galatians 5 and verse 19 beginning, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So there are all kinds of sins that he lists out there. There are sexual or sensual sins. There are sins of religion. There are sins of character and of attitude, if you will. So he talks about a lot of those in here. Now, we may not be guilty of adultery, but are we, a guilt, are we guilty of idolatry? Are we guilty of jealousy? We may not be guilty of murder, but are we guilty of envy or drunkenness? You know, we're all guilty of something at some point in our life because we choose to turn away from God and follow the ways of the world. In 1 John chapter 2, it categorizes sin in three different categories. It talks about the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And if you're honest with yourself, you will recognize, yes, I'm guilty probably of all three at some time or another. I've been guilty of all three. You know, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says that you are a sinner, but the Bible also says that God loves you. You know, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, the apostle tells us there very plainly, 1 John 4, verse 8, He does not love, does not know God, for God is love. God is the essence of love. God is the uh, origin of love, but he is love, and he loves you, and he loves me in spite of the fact that we have rebelled against him. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, you know, just a couple of chapters after Paul said that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, in Romans 5, verse 6, he writes this, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners... Christ died for us. You see, even when God could look down through time and see that we are in sin, we would rebel against him, he sent his son to die for us. And he loves us, even though we're in rebellion. Now, he can't have fellowship with us because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But that doesn't mean he lacks love. No, God loves us. God loves you and God loves me. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and see that God is rich in mercy. In Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1, 
It says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So he's talking to Ephesians who have become Christians. They've had their sins forgiven. But but think about what he's saying to them. He made them alive. They were dead in trespasses and sins before, in which you also once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So again, Paul's highlighting how we all sin, we all rebel against God, we all follow our own selfish desires and will in life. But because of God's great love for us, he's made a way for us to be forgiven. It says that he is rich in mercy. And he wants you to have that mercy. He wants me to have that mercy. In John chapter 3, verse 16, you probably know this passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God loved us to the extent that he sent his son into this world to suffer and die and to be a sacrifice for our sins. And it's through the blood of Christ that our sins may be forgiven. You see, the Bible says we are sinners, but it also says God loves us and God wants us to be saved. And you can be saved and I can be saved. In 1 John chapter, or rather 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's read here verses 9 through 11, and let's understand it doesn't matter what sin you've committed, how many sins you have committed, you can be forgiven of your sins. The Bible states that very plainly and very clearly. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Paul, first of all, says, look, if you're involved in sin, you can't go to heaven. You're living in sin. You cannot go to heaven. It's impossible. But then he says, such were some of you. Some of the people at Corinth, he says, they were fornicators. They were adulterers. They were homosexuals. They were sodomites. They were. They no longer are, but they were. Some of them were idolaters. Some were thieves. Some were covetous. Some were drunkards. Were, but they no longer were that way when Paul wrote to them. He says, such were some of you, but now, he says, you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. You have had your sins forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how did those Corinthians have their sins forgiven? Because however they had their sins forgiven is the same way you and I can have our sins forgiven. The Bible says you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. But the Bible also says that you can be saved and I can be saved. In Acts 18, Acts 18, if you notice there in verse 1, it says that Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So 1 Corinthians 6, he's writing a letter to these people who are there. Now, first Acts chapter 18, Acts 18, I want you to notice verse 8 here. It says, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, 
believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. They heard the word of God, they believed that word of God, and they applied it by being baptized. Just like Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, right? So the Corinthians believed and they were baptized. That means they were saved. As Paul says over in 1 Corinthians 6 that we just read, they were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So the Bible says you can be saved no matter what sins you've committed, no matter how long you've committed those sins, how many years you've been involved in them, no matter how many sins you have committed, you can be forgiven of those things. That's what the Bible says about you. You are God's creation, loved by him in spite of the fact that you're a sinner. There is a plan of salvation laid out in the word of God that you, by your free will, can accept that plan of salvation. You can believe and you can make the decision to follow it, to apply it, to obey the Lord that your sins may be forgiven. And we would love to help you in doing that. So please reach out and let us know how we can help you to be saved, to live righteously, and to have the hope of heaven and to look forward to being with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity. Please reach out and let us hear from you.